So hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this third webinar of the Digital Coffee Feature Series. As you probably might know already, while we wait for everyone to um, jump in the webinar, uh, I will make a quick introduction to the series and to the session. So uh, this webinar started as a response from myself and Sarah Moroki from Luna Origin Consulting to the urge and the need that we felt of creating a space where we could start talking as an industry about digitalization, share different perspectives, but also somehow share lessons learned, challenges and needs uh, around digitalizing coffee. This session specifically will focus on implementation and we want to give you um, a bit of uh, perspective from origin in, in this case. And it will be very much connected to providing digital tools to smallholder farmers, but also how to provide them as, as smaller players in the, in the sector. Uh, to do this, we have four amazing speakers with us. Um, Ankur Set from IDH, Sanhi Tark from Bien Voyage, uh, Shakil Padamsi from the Coffee Gardens, and Rachel Nakasita from Ibero Uganda. Before we start, as you probably might know, we have an introduction to the session, so some housekeeping information, and probably many of you already <laughs> listened to this twice, but I, I will have to, to give it to you again anyway. So uh, the webinar will be recorded. Um, the panel will basically function with an initial panel session where we will interact with myself and um which i will be the moderator for the session and uh, the speakers and then it will be followed by um, a q a session where we'll open the floor to questions that will come in uh during during the webinar from from you the attenders uh to ask questions please use the q a tab uh, we had a few issues last time uh, for the last webinar because you were using the chat it's also fine but the problem is that we have issues in somehow um keeping track of the questions coming in. So please, if you can, do use the Q&A tab. It's easier for us to make sure that we can answer as many questions as possible towards the end of the session. Finally, um, we are not using slides for this, for this webinar series. So we recommend you to uh, choose the gallery mode. Basically, on the top right hand side of your screen, you can click the button. And that gives you the chance to uh, look at us, all the speakers and myself, uh, at the same time. It makes it a bit more engaging. And also very importantly, even though this is not a physical event, unfortunately, it's really nice to know who are the attendees. So please do introduce yourself, share with us your name and also the country or the city where you're joining us from. Also very importantly, please, uh, if you want to share the insights of this webinar and promote the series, um, don't forget to use the hashtag Digital Coffee Future. And last but not least, actually this is very important, we want to thank our partners, IDH, Barista Magazine and the Coffee Podcast, and our sponsors, eCrop Origin, Cropster, Sustainable Harvest for believing in this initiative and supporting, supporting us through the, through the series. So now I will stop sharing my screen. So again, as recommended, if you want, please um, use the uh, gallery mode and somehow we'll start um, into the session. So um, during our first two webinars, somehow we try to provide an overview of uh, the meaning of digitalization. Uh, where together with Sarah, Ashley and Vera, we really try to um, set the frame around digitalization, try to understand what it means and how and, and which are the different digital tools that can be implemented. In the second webinar, somehow we moved to um, a step further, which was like try to understand the efficiency of the solutions through the experiences of um, Ivania, Isabel, Richard and um, Yorick in, in what has been their perspective in using digital tools for their companies and their organization this time. We are going even a step further with really a uh, perspective from origin and uh, what it means to implement, to concrete implement the solutions um, with smaller farmers as said before, but also smaller players. Before we um, dive into the conversation, we have the first poll for you. So we'll now activate so you can also share your perspective on this. 
So here the question is like, if you were going to go digital with your company and the organization, what will be the most important aspect for you to consider? Uh, will it be connected to price or maybe to integration with operations or with your colleagues and, and users or scalability, for example? Um, let's see and wait for the answers to come in. I don't know if any of the speakers, maybe Rachel, would you, would you share your, what, what would you pick on this one? You're a mute. <laughs> um, oh crap. Um, I think I'd pick easy integration with current uh, operations. That would be the most important. Um, yeah, for now that would be really the most important because I, I'm, I'm quite ahead. So yeah, that, that would be most important All first right. and then we can get to price. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I guess now we, the last answers are coming in. So maybe a last 10 seconds and then we can close the pool. Okay, that's, that's great. So I would say that the majority actually agrees with you, even though it's, there's this slight difference between uh, operations and somehow easy to use for yeah, colleagues but... and users which yeah. can also be misleading. So, but it's still very interesting to know. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everyone to somehow share this with us. Um, so I guess this is an opportunity to start uh, from a bigger picture. And um, this is why I will ask Ankur, I know you've been, uh, you have had an extensive experience really using the tools and integrating uh, the solutions in different countries like uh, in Southeast Asia, India, but also Africa. And I think it would be nice to have like the broader perspective from your side and somehow, um, I don't know if you could share with us some lessons learned, but also what are for you the main pillars to somehow take into, into consideration when, when implementing these tools at, at origin? Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, thanks, uh, Lisa. Um, this is um, quite, uh, I mean, there's a, uh, quite something that we could uh, pack here, um, especially given how fast digital solutions have um, evolved since the time uh, I started out in this space, which was in 2013. Uh, but some of the core pillars can, um, and the, some of the core factors can be broadly categorized into two big things that I see. One are the key levers, and one are the key success factors within those levers. So uh, when we talk about levers, partnership with a value chain aggregator, um, partnership with a technology provider, and having a conducive environment are the three broad pillars that you could um, uh, implement your digital solution. Um, so I'll try and explain this a little bit. Uh, when I talk about a value chain aggregator, I mean um, someone like NKG is a great example. You know, you have a um, lot of coffee farmers, there is a trader, and uh, the coffee farmers are associated with the trader. Uh, so if you really want to implement a digital solution, you go and partner with NKG. But having said that, uh, in, in the recent years, uh, there is also a new category of aggregators who've come up. So a lot of these technology providers have now become aggregators, right? For smallholders especially, because they're reaching out to uh, smallholders in uh, ways that are never seen before. So. We were in Indonesia and we were trying to work with food services value chain uh, where a lot of women uh, work. Uh, and we were trying to find who's an agri sort of a food aggregator there. Um, and uh, it turned out Grab, uh, which is a, which is a, started out as a you know, uh, logistic service, a cab service, uh, came out to be a great aggregator for those food services value chain. Similarly, in India, we were trying to digitize and work with uh, dairy value chains and uh, a big dairy company um, came out to be a great partner for us. Uh, in terms of the conducive tech environment and uh, uh, conducive external environment, I think more or less this has al already in place in the most of the countries, of course, uh, with varying degrees. So, you know, mobile and internet penetration has reached uh, these countries, uh, but a big plus is if you have any government support or a local government department that could support. Um, and the last bit, the technology provider, uh, you could 
uh, a technology partner, you could have that as your internal resource or a consultant. You can be part of a larger program uh, with that are backed by a lot of funders and donors. And you could also have uh, someone uh, uh, from the team of the technology provider himself partnering with. So these are the broad levers. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at the success factors, um, I think what a lot of people miss out is starting from the fundamentals. So, uh, you know, going paperless and uh, making your records paperless is, is a key success factor, I believe. And uh, you have to do it in layers. So um, I, I can give an example of how the Indian government uh, you know, try to digitize an ecosystem here in India, and they followed a four-step approach, uh, which was called a paperless uh, layer, a presence-less layer, a cashless layer, and a consent layer. I think it's that, that, it's a very good uh, model to uh, guide you in terms of going digital. So you know, you first go paperless, then you go presence-less, where you you know get traceability, farm management information systems. Uh, sensor-based uh, information systems bring in, then you go cashless, and then, uh, you know, things around consent and data privacy can come in. So that's a broader uh, four-level layer you could follow. Uh, another big success factor is building trust uh, amongst your uh, smallholders. So uh, smallholders can be uh, pretty unforgiving when, you know, they deal with technological glitches, especially if it's their first time experience. So you need to onboard, um, uh, you know, community agents, uh, people who are a little bit tech savvy, part of the community, um, that can that can really, um, you know, catalyze the entire effort. Um, and another thing that has really coming up in the recent years that I've seen is incentivization. So uh, smallholders were earlier and still are not really the end users of technology till now. Uh, mostly, this is being deployed by a lot of intermediaries. But I'm seeing a lot of projects that are now uh, nudging these smallholders to start uh, putting in data. It could be through feature phones or smartphones. Um, for example, in Singapore, there is a fish coin project, which is actually uh, giving uh, aquaculture smallholder aquaculture farmers uh, mobile airtime data uh, in return from uh, in return for putting in data in their app. So that's, that's something that's really coming up and I'm seeing some more examples of it. The last bit is making the technology, the software and the hardware user friendly. Um, and I can't say that enough. And I sometimes find it a little bit amusing to see how uh, increasingly technology is becoming easier and easier for more literate, more urban people to use day by day. So much so that kids can also, you know, uh, use uh, mobile phones and tabs without any uh, training really, uh, but such dedicated efforts are not being made for small holders. Uh, and if if you could use more audiovisual uh, tools for uh, uh, you know making them use the digital technology, India do wonders. But having said that, Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp have really um, I say they're they're the ones who are changing this. Um, yeah, so this is broadly what. Um, uh, can be done in order to really catalyze your implementation efforts. Thank you so much, Ankur. I guess this is this is very interesting, and I and I hope that um, somehow the process is is also clear for for who is following us today, because I think like it's it's really important to understand that you know you you need a step by step basis. It's it's very difficult to go from one to ten all the way up in in one single shot. So that's that's definitely a lesson to learn that is probably very helpful for for many but also the fact that um, at the end it's really need to be easy to use and and therefore somehow being able to answer to the needs of, of the users and in this case small older farmers we know are are very um, so, sometimes are, are um, very specific users as well with with uh, challenges and barriers around that so that's that's important to take into consideration I guess that um, looking at the, the bigger picture now, we can deep dive into, into some examples here. And, and I will start from Rachel um, in regard to, to Bloom and the fact that uh, the system started um, in 2017, so just like two years ago, and somehow now he helps very much to, to basically uh, 
give digital services to more than 20,000 farmers, if I'm not mistaken. So could you share with us, Rachel, a bit um, how you did that, how you integrated uh, technology for farmers, but also within your company? Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I wanted to, I thought it would be great to give some sort of perspective on what uh, NKG Bloom is and how did we start, how did we how did we end up to where we are now? Um, and basically really uh, NKG Bloom is a sustainable coffee sourcing strategy that uh, was started in 2017, um, really through a conglomerate of, of different partners that came together that uh, with us as Ibero Uganda to form uh, NKG Bloom. And, um, the reason for this really is uh, looking at the Ugandan perspective. We have about uh, 1.3 million uh, coffee farming households uh, in, in my country. And this deviates between 1.3 and 1.7, depending on what, on whose data you, you are using. Um, but yeah, so these really 1.3 million coffee farming families, uh, despite great uh, agroclimatic conditions that we have in my country, Uganda, uh, for coffee production and, you know, a constant global increase in demand for coffee. We find that smallholder coffee farmers still really operate at very low productivity. So the, the reasons for this are really varied, you know, depending, again, on, 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 on which scholar you are. Uh, you know, we have lack of reliable access to agronomic skills. Of course, we have lack of access to inputs, to finance, uh, to markets, and... Um, so for us as Ibero, as a coffee exporter in Uganda, we realized that we were far short of our possible potential uh, of uh, sourcing coffee, but also the farmer at an individual level was really uh, quite uh, short. So it's in this regard that we came together, the Neumann Cafe Group, which is the acronym for NKG, came together through a network of, ma of partner companies to create um, NKG Bloom Uganda, sustainable coffee sourcing. And uh, at the heart of NKG Bloom is a farmer financing unit, uh, which we have over time evolved into a farmer services unit. And here we provide uh, fertilizer and cash advances to farmers. Um, this is really uh, a part of a two-year crop nutrition program that, we, that we, we would hope would increase uh, farm level productivity by at least 75% after two years. I'm, I'm happy to report that we have uh, did our baseline, uh, midline last year, and we have over 90% increase of farm level productivity. So I just wanted to give you context of why did we even start Bloom? What were we doing? Why did we get into this um, to start financing farmers? And um, uh, our farmer, we have two products, or maybe I would put them in three. We give advances to farmer groups. All our farmers are, are organized uh, along structures and we put them in farmer groups, whether they be uh, that we found them organized uh, through uh, partner organizations that have been training um, and organizing farmers into some sort of structures for over time, or farmer groups that we ourselves as Iberia Uganda have actually um, put together and formed. So we give them fun, um, advances uh, to these groups to when the coffee delivery season has started. And uh, this is really uh, to help them buy coffee and ultimately sell to us. Um, the other key product that we give is fertilizer loans uh, to individual farmers. We have two types of high quality fertilizers um, that we lend to farmers and as well um, cash loans to individual farmers. And these really operate like uh, mobile money uh, overdrafts. So um, IT is very integral. Uh, I, I, with that feedback, uh, I wanted to, to really reel uh, the audience in and to just draw for you a picture of how important um, IT is to uh, NKG Bloom, to the Pharma Services Unit, because it is what helps us ensure traceability. And Kul talked about tra traceability and transparency. It, what helps, it, it is what helps us manage our pre-crop crop financing. It's what helps us communicate with farmers. It's what helps us manage my entire credit you know, line, interest rates, accurate repayments, and ETC. So uh, we have four IT systems in NKG Bloom Uganda. Um, and I will start with probably uh, the data collection app in the field. 
And uh, this is where we have all pharma transactional data. And this includes deliveries, this includes um, uh, application taking, this includes uh, pharma group recommendation, this includes uh, contract signing when they're about to get a loan, this is repayment. All of this uh, is uh, in my field uh, data collection app um, as one system. My second system is my loan management system. As you can imagine, um, I need something to, you know, to balance my books, uh, to really uh, give me the right reports and all sorts of advances management. Uh, that is a back end system that really uh, works for me as, you know, as a lender. Um, the third system is what we call our coffee management system. And this one really manages our coffee deliveries. Every time the farmers bring their coffee uh, that is being sold to us at our factory, that is a system that we use. And that system um, feeds into the field data collection app. Uh, you know, they're able to communicate. There's an API. There, there's a communication protocol between the two. And my last system, something that Uncle also talked about, was uh, an aggregator. Um, and this aggregator is is, is 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 yeah is one of my favorite because uh, it also helps me communicate with my farmers as first thing first you know it helps me communicate with my farmers it helps me send mobile money to them um, and we usually uh, or the farmers are using what we call a USSD and uh, you know a USSD is simply an unstructured supplementary service data but if i could break it down a communication protocol a future code a quick code that a cellular you know phone user can just punch in with their phone and it will help them communicate with a mobile network operator so with such a quick code uh, my farmers are able to get you know information on um repayments information on um available cash advance, they can request a cash advance, they can know what my product price is, they can make applications for my loans. And um, yeah, so those are my four systems. In, in terms of which to a pharma centric, I would definitely say like, uh, like I mentioned, the aggregator and the field, you know, the field data collection app. So those are our systems, all integrated. The aggregator talks to my loan management system and um, he talks to uh, my field data collection app. So a lot of integration, which is very important to me to make sure that I serve my farm as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. So uh, here the key is, is really like communicating with farmers, have everything tracked and in a way also talking. Uh, so integration basically between the different tools to to get to to something so structured as as um nkg bloom but of course we all know that this is not the case for everybody <laughs> and uh and somehow we also start from from different levels in a way so i guess this is this is my connection to being voyage and 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 to sanhi in saying that i know that you've been somehow actively training women and um, coffee farmers um, in, in Costa Rica now for, for um, basically teaching them anything that is connected with coffee production, financial literacy, and you decided to move to digital training. So it would be interesting if you, if you can share with us how that works and, and what have been somehow some of the lessons learned for, for you. Um, sure. Um, thank you, Elisa, thank for you. your kind introduction and thank you so much for the question. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, Bin Voyage is a feminist organization based in Costa Rica that has been closely working with smaller women coffee producers for the past four years um, with the mission to reduce the gender gap in coffee farming communities, especially um, when it comes to access to information, technical assistance um, and market opportunities. Um, for the past um, four years, we have been providing these trainings and market opportunities in person, um, adopting gender inclusive approach in methodology and content. Um, and in fact, we, have, we were planning to go digital with our curriculum by end of this year um, to improve the accessibility and scalability of our curriculum. Um, however, <laughs> as we all know, um, in the wake of COVID-19, um, we had to quickly adapt 
and pivot to a digital space um, to ensure the safety of everyone and continue um, fulfilling the mission that we have um, at our organization. Um, and to inform us, um, we've um, conducted a few research um, on some of the popular edu edu educational platforms, um, such as Udemy and Moodle, um, you know, among others. Um, and we quickly realized that they were out of reach for a lot of the smallholder women producers that we are working with, um, since um, the producers that we work with have um, limited access to technology, such as, you know, they own simple phones that only support text, call and WhatsApp, um, as well as unstable um, internet connections um, and their relative, um, li relatively limited ability to read and digest heavy text. Um, so those um, you know, popular educational platforms seem like they were not a good fit. Um, and as we were dealing with some time sensitive content that needed to be provided to producers immediately um, on post harvest practices, such as green coffee storage and export regulations after their harvest was done in March, um, we had to make the transition quite quickly. Um, and what we knew from working with smallholder producers for the past four years is that WhatsApp is well received by all ages. Um, and you know, accessible in different regions in Costa Rica. Um, it's quite easy to use um, and has features such as audios, images, and emojis um, that seemed quite promising for us, for the pilot. Um, so for the past three months, we've been providing our participants with over 56 hours of training on 16 topics, including export regulations, quality analysis, farm and household finances, um, and we also shared knowledge materials on how to mitigate financial risk um, during these uncertain times um, to 67 producers in five communities through WhatsApp. Um, we've also hosted five what we call the master courses where experts in each field were invited to speak and host live Q&A sessions um, with our participants. Um, so that's what we've been doing um, for the past few months um, and some of the initial observations that we were able to have um, from this pilot um, phase of our program um, seems, seems to be quite promising. Um, you know, it seems to suggest that WhatsApp um, is a promising educational platform. Um, and we've seen um, from our participants um, that 97% of the participants in our program scored um, over 60% or higher in the evaluation test, um, which I think is a, um, we think is a strong um, sign towards the knowledge retention and then um, the distribution um, score. Um, and the average score um, of the participants um, in our program was um, 78.1 out of 100. Um, and 95% of the participants expressed that this program was useful for them and would recommend it to their network. Um, and we, however, obviously had 9% of the farmer attrition rate where um, in numbers actually six participants dropped out during the program due to um, personal reasons more than anything. Um, so overall, we've been able to test the potential WhatsApp as a platform um, that it's not only um, you know, there to serve organizations like ours um, with you know, limited um, human capacity um, to stay connected with smallholder producers, especially during um, these uncertain times um, where you know, obviously our own mobility is also restri restricted, um, but it also has shown us that um, WhatsApp has the capacity to provide essential knowledge materials um, and ensure retention rates um, if the methodology is um, well thought out um, for the program. Thank you so much. This is, this is really, really interesting how you can basically use something that is, you know, WhatsApp doesn't really um, start as a, as a virtual training platform, but at the end is, is what you need. So this, this is really, really interesting. And in a way, I feel also um, there is a very interesting story behind um, the coffee garden. So, Shaquille, could you, you, you basically started from scratch and um, it would be nice to see and to know in a way what has been your process and, and how you implemented digital tools for your farmers. Great. Thanks, Eliza. So I'm going to start with really what was the beginning of our journey and what our first steps were, particularly focusing on the challenges and the lessons that we learned. Uh, maybe just a little bit of a little bit of context. So, firstly, we're a very young organisation. We've only been around for three years, and especially at the beginning, although still now, we're spending a lot of time figuring things out and figuring out how to find our feet. Um, and although I do have a tech background, it certainly wasn't the first thing that we were thinking about. But as we were working through different steps, different processes, we realised there were challenges, and we started to see opportunities to bring in technology to to make it 
easier, but it was certainly an iterative process. Secondly, we're working with smallholder farmers in the east of Uganda at high altitudes. So these smallholder farmers really are like very small. Um, they, are, they will have one, maybe more gardens. These gardens may be around an acre in size. So on average last year, our farmers were producing around 500 kilos of cherry. So it's, it's a really small scale. And just to give you a little idea of the context, I mean, you have these absolutely stunning mountains, but as you get close, you realize that the only way to get up them are these tiny little like motorcycle pathways. And for us to get to the top can take us like an hour via motorcycle, but when it rains, you have this thick, sticky mud and you're trying to get up there and it could take you two hours to get to the top. You know, there's no electricity, there's um, no mobile network in most places. Even then farmers have, uh, maybe 50% of the farmers have phones and these are predominantly feature phones, not smartphones. So this is really like the context where we're working. Uh, it's, it's a really tough environment, um, but still very, very rewarding. And at the beginning, so three years ago, we were just working with one farmer and just a few tons. And even then, even as, like I said, we were still trying to figure out our processes, but very quickly we were realizing that there were all sorts of challenges around like financial accountability, managing inventory and, and general traceability. And this is at the farmer level, but it's also of course affecting us. And I, I think part of the issue was that at the beginning, we really overestimated the capacity of the farmer that we were working with. Uh, he was very confident, but very quickly we realized that his record keeping was pretty much non-existent. And as we were learning the business as well, we realized that you know, it's so important to, to learn about your outturns, to be able to calculate your margins. So we knew that we had to get a grip on these issues really quickly. So the second year, so two years ago, we decided to build a wet mill and we, we expanded and still small, but about 10 farmers. And although we were dealing with the processing ourselves, we had new challenges that we were, we were seeing because you know, our farmers are on top of the mountain, they're at 2000 plus meters above sea level and our wet mill is at around 1500 meters. So we need to get the coffee down, but because the farmers lived up top, we basically placed our field team up in the top and they were living there for, for a week at a time. Uh, and it's not feasible for them to come up and down. It's just, it's just not possible. Um, and so the challenge was is that our team were engaging in, in financial transactions and the coffee was coming down, but we weren't necessarily, well, we needed to get those accountabilities. We needed to get those receipts to make sure that whatever was being purchased was reaching us. So we decided to use Comcare, which is a great mobile app. It allows you to collect data offline. Um, and it's, it's quite straightforward to, to build, but to tell the truth, we, we overcomplicated it. And our field officer also really wasn't comfortable with tech. So by the time we spotted this, it took us a little bit of time. We retrained him, but, but the damage had been done. We had delays, we had a big backlog, and we just needed to get on with it. We had to keep going, we had to get, I mean, we all know how short the coffee season is. So we had to keep cherries flowing into the station. And although I'm not proud of it, we had to just keep dispersing funds, even though we didn't have proper accountabilities. So at the end of the season, it took us ages to get our records in order. It was a bit of a nightmare and certain things didn't quite add up. And then we even had one farmer come to us several months at the end of the season saying that um, he hadn't received a payment for, for a significant transaction. So, you know, we were, we were not happy at all with, with our systems. It's not just the technology, but it, our overall systems uh, when it came to like a financial accountability and, and inventory management. Now, we also knew it was our first season running a washing station, and we'd been entirely focusing on like getting our operations right, you know, processing coffee to the highest possible quality. So we knew why we hadn't prioritized our systems, but at the same time, uh, our whole experience, particularly around the financial accountability and the inventory management, showed us that if we wanted to scale, and we absolutely did, we would have to, to you know, get a hold of those, get those sorted out, because these were our biggest barriers um, to profitability and to scalability. Uh, and I, I'll leave that there for now, and yeah, thanks. Thank you, Shaquille. Uh, I know there's more to the story, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, I would say that we need to pause for a moment, uh, again, to just um, keep the energy up. Uh, we have the second pool, just to make sure that we don't lose the attendees in the process. So here we want to ask you, which is your biggest need if you're looking at digitalizing your value chain? 
and again, take a bit of time to just read um, the questions we have, so answers, actually. We have a few options, like have access to uh, industry-wide knowledge, perhaps you would like to, to know more about lessons learned or other initiatives, or maybe you would like to discuss with other players and just um, know more about what they are doing, uh, get connected with tech providers so to understand if they could be the solution for you. So yeah, let us know what you think. And uh, maybe, I don't know if someone, um, from from the panelists wants to wants to take this, uh, maybe Sanhi, maybe uh, that that could be something. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, I was actually just debating between the last two options. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think the return on investment and also kind of knowing what could be the strategy forward. Um, could be, yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> So I guess we'll, um, I see that the responses are coming in, but probably might take a bit longer than the normal. So let's, let's also maybe um, hear from Shaquille, if, which one would you pick? Um, I also went for return on investment. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it's, um, you can have uh, like amazing tech tools, but if you just can't afford it, then, <laughs> then yeah. it, it kind of it makes it very challenging to implement. Right. Thank you. Um, so I guess we can now start um, closing the pool. So that's great. So I would say that there are different, um, I feel like everybody has different needs here. And it's interesting to know that in a way, you know, everyone sees this as an opportunity probably, but of course there's like some due diligence to, to do before, before uh, starting the process. And I think in a way, uh, this is very much connected to what we're going to cover with the, uh, with Ancour now regarding, you know, the needs of different players to start this process. And if you are a player sometime, maybe not a big company, but more like a smaller organizations, you need this extra support. Uh, from someone that can provide you with uh, recommendation, um, feedback, and maybe just like some some level of, of guide uh, regarding what you can actually do as a player that um, wants to go digital. So, uh, Ankur, I know that IDH has been has been supporting this player as on 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 this regard. Could you somehow share with us how that works and what has been the process there? Sure. Yeah, yeah, Lisa. Um, so, uh, digital transformation um, as an optimization exercise has been traditionally employed by um, larger companies, and uh, obviously because it required employing specialized consultants. Um, you know, there's large investments both in terms of service fee, the time that is required, uh, sitting down with consultants, and it takes, um, I mean, it's, it's an effort, um, both on the part of the consultant and also on the part of the, uh, the enterprise. Uh, but what's, what started to happening is with rapidly developing, uh, you know, expanding universe of agriculture technology startups, there are a lot of agri-service providers, uh, such as traders, processors, producer organizations that have a desire uh, to go digital and uh, they cannot afford to do so, uh, both in terms of fee and time. And uh, as Shaquille was right now mentioning, there are already uh, a lot of uh, challenges that early stage organizations grab with and uh, you don't want to present them with a, with a complex process, uh, which only adds to that, uh, that list of challenges. Um, so we at IDH uh, saw that gap um, and what we uh, decided to do is try to simplify the entire process and uh, basically help agri-service providers jumpstart their digital journey by prioritizing uh, what was the right uh, technology that they should uh, implement or adopt. There is a whole bunch of technologies in use proposal, but what is it that you should do? Uh, and it could be as basic as, as I was saying, uh, digitizing your records, but uh, you, it has to be tailored in, in, that, in that sense. So what, what we've developed, uh, I mean, it's under development, it should be launched in the next two or three months, is to 
a digital platform uh, which is tracking uh, over uh, 47 technology use cases um, and technology providers in Latin America, in uh, Africa, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and what we help uh, agri services, agri service providers is with that tool, uh, we can uh, make them prioritize which is the best technology for them. Uh, also assess what is the estimated ROI on that technology uh, that they will receive and, uh, and make them uh, uh, make an assessment of the digital maturity of that organization which a lot of uh, a lot of these organizations would uh, probably ignore because um, i mean they, they won't be aware that um, that this this is something which is critical in, when you're adopting a solution we can perform that assessment as well uh, and this would be done at a fraction of the time and cost um, so we are very excited to do this and uh, supporting the enterprise in the first step and then if if you know there is um, potential that they see with this technology solution that is identified. Uh, we can also come in from an, another service angle, uh, helping them pilot the solution. We can also uh, help create the entire roadmap and solution design. So we have created that entire service line, but DTA, the digital transformation advice, would be the first step in that digital. Thank you so much, Shankar. So basically, it's really understanding what's the best tool and somehow what's the strategy behind um, implementing the solutions. So I guess um, and we'll, we'll move to, to Sanhi and, and really understand a bit more about like what has been your process. Like uh, what were you looking, when, when you were looking at different options, uh, you felt like what sub was the, was the right one for you. And um, in a way that was actually was actually true for being Voyage. Could you could you share how uh, that that happened? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so when we were looking at different platforms um, and looking to go digital with our curriculum, um, I think what was at the center, at the core of our um, research um, and our mission has been the accessibility. So what we were looking at um, more closely on accessibility were on three elements. Um, so the first one was accessibility in content, um, which we were already quite familiar with um, as we were working um, you know, already with the smallholder producers, um, specifically women in the past. Um, we knew what kind of languages um, to adopt and our curriculum already reflected um, the gender inclusivity um, aspect of it. Um, but obviously we have to like make sure that this was going to be transferred um, to the digital curriculum. Um, and the second element that we were looking at um, was we had to think carefully about the methodology, um, especially, um, you know, how we are going to distribute this knowledge um, as you're moving to a digital space from in-person training space was really important for us. Um, because since, um, you know, in comparison to in-person training where we were able to gauge um, throughout the training session, how everybody's engaging and how everybody's like following through with our content. Um, you know, that can actually sometimes be quite technical. Um, with the digital space, um, we weren't able to ensure that just like that. Um, so that was one element that we had to think about um, when it came to methodology. Um, as um, additionally, um, with participants coming from different age groups and educational backgrounds, um, we were also wanting to incorporate um, dynamic learning approach to ensure that um, everyone was able to learn the materials and implement them um, on their farms and households um, with ease. Um, the last element that we were looking at um, in terms of accessibility of the platform um, was that it had to be a platform that was going to be easy um, to be used by the participants and easily adapted um, as well by them um, because we didn't want to develop something and not have that trans, you know, um, be used by our participants. Um, we were looking at the adaptability um, and then the easy to use um, element. Um, we also needed to support um, the methodology that we were going to adapt um, for our virtual training. Um, so, you know, the platform needed to have features such as audio, images, um, infographs, um, and, you know, features that would let us play games um, to ensure the dynamic aspect um, of the curriculum. 
So considering all these elements um, regarding, you know, accessibility, um, you know, to us, it seemed like WhatsApp was a good enough platform um, to start testing with our time sensitive content. Um, and from our experience so far, we we're able to actually, um, you know, we are, we are quite proud to say that um, it has been quite successful um, with um, the current participants that we have. And um, we think that it has definitely ensured us with that um, accessibility. Um, you know, on WhatsApp, um, we make an active use of audio, short text with emojis, um, infographs and images to share content um, and also play games to engage um, with our participants. Um, we also, um, when we are creating the methodology um, like content um, regarding the methodology, we make sure that our content is broken down into multiple audio files um, based on the contents and then they are being accompanied by assessing, uh, assisting visuals um, to help participants um, with their learning experience. Um, so what we have been able to see um, through this um, program, like the pilot phase of our program, um, is that first, um, as you know, I briefly shared earlier um, in my previous section, the knowledge retention rate went up with the participants, um, and they've all expressed um, satisfaction as they're able to take their time to learn their materials um, instead of often, you know, being provided with lots of content over a course of a day. Um, in the case of in-person training. Um, and secondly, they've also expressed that um, they ap appreciate the flexibility element um, that was accompanied um, in this methodology. Um, this observation was quite important for us um, as we are concerned, we're always concerned with women's um, comparative time poverty with lots of responsibilities in their hands. Um, so this, you know, this specific observation um, that um, with the flexibility of like when the producers were gonna, you know, um, consume the materials, um, and interact and engage with them um, was really important as the new approach facilitated um, this flexible learning um, for all of our participants. Um, and the last element, um, it was also quite important. Um, it was an important remark made by our participants um, and it was related to their mobility where um, not only were our participants happy about saving the time to travel to training facilities, they're also able to overcome the mobility constraints that existed um, previously, um, especially for them. Um, so that um, I think as you know, as a um, so in our experience, um, going digital with our curriculum has been quite beneficial um, through WhatsApp especially because um, we're speaking about specific demographics um, of the producers that our organization um, you know, is set to um, collaborate with. Thank you so much. So here again, the, the, the key word is somehow accessibility, I believe. The fact that at the end, it's really finding the right tool for the right users and make sure that um, can be accessible in very different forms for them. And, and this is a bit being the key also for, for the use of WhatsApp for being Voyage. Um, I think somehow this is also something connected with the coffee gardens and how you included the simple solutions uh, to really respond to the needs of, of a very small older farmers and, and also your operations. So again, uh, Shaquille, I know that um, somehow you you stopped the story at some point uh, with your with your previous answer. So could you explain a bit more how you decided to use these tools and and in a way um, how they've been accessible for your farmers? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I'll start with. I mean, I've described in, in quite some length the challenges that we were facing. So I'm now going to turn on to. Um, you know, what were our needs? So last year we sat down and, as a team and said, you know, what do we need our system to look like? Uh, what do what we need our tools to do for us? So we came up with six key areas. The first was, and this definitely came from the team, which is make it as simple as possible. You know, it needs to also follow the actual process, not like an imagined ideal process. It has to be grounded in reality. The second thing was that although we felt that we'd done a good job at collecting the data that we needed, we hadn't done as good a job as getting information back to the farmers. And this could be in the form of like receipt paperwork or booklets for recording transactions because they just didn't have their own tools and we needed to give them those tools so they could also feel confident in, in their transactions with us. Thirdly, we we needed a channel for farmers to communicate with us without being blocked by any intermediaries. For example, in the case that they weren't getting paid. So we needed to, to reduce those barriers for communication. And similarly, 
um, we also needed to have effective and efficient channels for, for widespread communication with our farmers, particularly in ways that are agnostic of power or, or gender issues. You know, or, like often people will go through lead farmers who tend to be older men from a community and they may withhold information uh, or there may be a sense that they're withholding information. So we wanted to be able to communicate with as many people as possible um, to get out as much information as possible. Fifth, and, and I've touched on this already, you know, we need to know that our team who are, built, who are buying coffee up in the mountain, uh, that the coffee that they're buying is the same volume as the coffee that we're receiving at, at our station. So, and if there is any discrepancies, we need to know the same day so we can address it. And equally importantly as having these systems, we wanted our whole team to know about these systems so that there's a, it prevents temptation. People know there's oversight in place as well. Uh, and last but not least, uh, and this is again was another request from the team, was that we needed to start early enough to, to take the time to train the team to do some dry runs so that we weren't making changes in the middle of the, of the season when it's just chaos. Um, so what did we decide to use? So based on the team feedback, we continued to use ComCare. Um, so we would use this for registering farmers. We use this for recording every single transaction with a farmer, including photographs of, of every receipt and delivery note. Uh, we'd also use this for, for field assessments as well. And the team really loved it. Uh, they find it to be really easy to use. It doesn't really require much training. Um, and it's also easy on the back end to customize it. And for our size, it's also free, which is fantastic. Um, but then on the other side of it, we decided instead of getting a database, we decided just to use a very simple Google Sheets uh, a workbook where we would have a page where we or a sheet that we would do a daily export of data from Compare, just throw it in and our formulas on our dashboard pages would automatically generate our KPIs. So we would know what our volumes had been, what our prices, what our sales price or purchase price had been very, very quickly. And also an added bonus is that our team with their smartphones can also see those, those sheets in the field as well. So they can, there's no barriers for them to use it. Um, in terms of being able to communicate with our farmers, we use this fantastic tool called Tellerivet. So Tellerivet is this bulk SMS platform where you can, you can uh, enter all of your farmers, the telephone numbers, you can even include other information like their village or their gender. So if you want to send targeted messages to, to one location or to one gender, uh, then it's very easy to do that. You can also send very personalized information as well. And we were using this to inform farmers of any price updates or any training updates, or if we're distributing trees or actually now any information on, on COVID. But although we've used a number of tech platforms, we're also using a lot of low tech platforms as well, because we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, is appropriate for the context. So we're providing receipts for farmers, uh, delivery notes, but at the same time, we're making sure our team are taking pictures of this in Comcare and digitizing that information so that we're not wading through thousands of receipts. Um, we've given out farmer booklets to farmers so they can record all of their transactions. Um, at the end of each day, our team are doing obviously daily weigh notes of all the coffee they received, but because they're in the middle of pulping, it's, it's late in the evening, instead of using forms, we say just take a picture on WhatsApp, send it to us, so we can get that information very quickly and cross-reference it with the buying information. And we're even using reusable plastic tags for coffee batch tracking. So there's a whole host of, of tools. You know, I think if I can conclude, you know, it's, we took a lot of time to really understand our needs, but then we looked for what was the simplest and cheapest options. And we stitched a few different things together and there is a little bit of manualness to it, but it has worked really well, as long as there's a lot of diligence and follow up on that tool. And for us, you know, in the, the result was that from, from, last, from the year before last to last year, we went from 10 farmers to 300 farmers. You know, we had something like two and a half thousand transactions. We went from dealing in 20, like buying 20 tons of cherry to 170 tons of cherry. And we didn't have a single of the issues that we faced before. So we really see firsthand how valuable the tech can be for us if it's properly implemented. Thank you so much, Shaquille. So yeah, here again. So it's I think the message is 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 pretty clear that it's really a step by step process, and it's really the key is really finding the right tools for your needs. Even though maybe you're using very simple tools, but still like they they make the trick. So I guess now we'll move to a conversation which is somehow connected, but it's more maybe 
uh, also linked to the first two webinars, which has been um, the importance of data management and basically what the, the role that the data has uh, when we talk about digitalization. And I, I want to ask this question to Rachel because I know that uh, at, um, using NKG Bloom, <coughs> excuse me, there's been a lot of, of uh, work behind data privacy, which is something that we haven't touched uh, yet during our webinar series. So it would be very interesting to know a bit more, Rachel, what about the process that um, you basically used um, in connection of exactly data privacy for, for your users. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. Um, again, I think like all previous speakers have said, uh, when working with data, I think for us uh, as a bureau, we understand that uh, the purpose of you know personal data protection um, isn't just to protect personal data, but to protect the fundamental rights and freedoms of persons that are related to that data. Uh, and so we knew that protecting personal data is possible. And while we're doing that, we needed to ensure that the, the, the person's rights and freedoms aren't being violated. And here we've uh, taken this in a three-pronged approach um, using the Data Privacy and Protection Act in Uganda now. Um, the first is uh, you know, the right to access your data. Um, we've collected uh, a lot of pharma data and um, as I said before, we, we collect data on deliveries, we collect data on loan applications, we collect data on monitoring visits, uh, assessment visits of a farmer's garden, we collect data on acreage, um, you know, all sorts of data. And we thought the first thing that, that we should do for a farmer, from a, for a smallholder farmer, is to give them access to this data. The second um, prong that we've taken here is um, informed consent. Uh, and this we thought was, I mean, even before we get into collecting this data, we thought it is important that they know that we're taking this data, who is it being shared with, uh, who, where is it going to be stored, uh, what kind of uh, security will it have. So um, for them to really know what it is that we want to do with their data in uh, a farmer a very farmer friendly way is, is, is the second prong that you took to data protection and privacy. Um, the last one um, that we did is the right to be forgotten. Um, and here we, we have, we take it in two ways. We have, I have farmers that are on my database as having delivered coffee or that have uh, had the data collected through the field uh, collection app but have really never taken a loan. So as long as they've never taken a loan, then they're not in my loan management system. So if a farmer that has taken a loan is, comes and says, I'd like to be forgotten, then no, of course not, you're not going to be forgotten because you need to pay up first. But if a farmer whose data I've taken comes and says, look, I'd like to be forgotten, then they have every right. And now we've taken steps in anonymization and um, ensuring that uh, this journey of data protection, and it is still, uh, as Uganda, it is still a very new subject. Um, it is still, uh, yeah, fresh, and uh, us being able to translate that to farmers has is still something we're, we're we're doing, and you know, just trying to tell them this is this is something that we need to do as as responsible as a responsible company. So that is those are the things that we have done really in in trying to help farmers walk this journey of data protection and privacy. Thank you so much, Rachel. So this is this is uh, really important and somehow a core process when when looking at data collection and and digitalization for for the coffee value chain. So it's really not just talking about farmers, but it's really talking about every single users that somehow is integrated in in the solutions. Um, I guess now we'll we'll move to the last pool for today. So please bear with us. So you can also share what you think about this process. Um, and the last one is, is more like probably something that we haven't asked before, which is like, what's, what has been your interest in, in coffee digitalization? What do you feel like uh, your company or your organizations is, is looking for now? 
um, for example, in stressability or improve performances or basically increase margins and decrease costs. <laughs> I see that there's like a couple of words missing there. Um, the fourth one is about uh, keeping internal track record of the different activities. And then finally, stay competitive. Um, I don't know, Ankur, if you, if you would like to pick one for us while people choose the, choose the answer as well. Sorry, putting you on the spot on this one. <laughs> <laughs> if you want other yeah no so yes i think it's uh, i chose the uh, one where you want to provide services uh, and more information to the farmers okay that's really fair because i was actually uh, trying to choose between traceability and uh, this one but traceability i think it's still for more specialty coffee makers mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess that um, interest from companies can be very different in a way, and um, it really depends also on on the on the core business, I would say. So, I guess now we can we can start ending the pools. We we can basically see that there is, um, I mean, two different um, two major major answers which is again uh, connected with farmers and also staying competitive which is definitely something important uh, but in a way answers were were quite various so it's again here a call to action to better understand that there is this interest but um, for many different reasons so I guess that the the last questions uh, will be very much connected a bit to to the future and the fact that we assume that if we want to use technology to really make it efficient, uh, it needs somehow to be scalable. It's not all the time like this, but definitely a very important point is, is scalability when we talk about technology. So I guess I will ask to, um, to Sanghi, what, what has been your process here if you think of scalability? Do you feel like you'll be able to use also WhatsApp in the future? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Elisa, for that question. I think it's quite timely because this week we just wrapped up our initial pilot with 67 producers, um, facilitated over the course of um, you know three months um, since April. Um, our experience so far has been, as I was sharing earlier, um, very um, positive um, using WhatsApp. Um, it's been a great tool to not only stay connected with our producers, um, you know, with ease, um, but also to provide them with technical assistance, especially in times like today. Um, WhatsApp's features have allowed our producers to go beyond, um, you know, passively receiving information um, and actively engaging um, with these materials um, through games and interactive activities um, played using voice notes, um, images, and emojis. Um, however, I, um, as you're um, asking, um, since it's also our initial pilot was only with um, about 67 producers in five different communities, um, we are also aware that um, we have to test how robust WhatsApp is um, when it comes to you know providing support to larger groups with bigger number um, of participants um, and thankfully for that um, we will be scaling up the program um, you know the distribution of the program through WhatsApp to 400 additional producers in Costa Rica um, in collaboration with the Embassy of Canada um, starting um, actually in September um, and we will be testing um, the robustness of, um, of this approach through WhatsApp for the next few months. Um, and I think with that result, um, we'll be able to share more about how robust the platform is. Um, and so far we are happy, um, but as you are rightly pointing out, um, it's also, um, I think in terms of um, management of data, as um, Rachel was mentioning earlier, um, and also management of groups, um, there are still some elements that um, we hope to be testing um, using WhatsApp working with larger groups. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess we're looking forward to seeing what, uh, <laughs> what will be uh, the next steps and, and what will work for you at Bin Voyage. Um, Shaquille, this, I, this is really like also somehow the same question for you. It's um, you're somehow still starting from 
as I said from from the very beginning, and it's interesting to see how you envision uh, scalability using these tools or perhaps using different tools. Great, thanks. So I guess I would start by first saying, you know, um, why I think this is so important. Uh, and it's, it's almost like a key message for, for other producers who are the same size as us, in that it is really important to start simple and focus on the most important needs. Um, it is an investment, but I think it's one definitely worth making for two key reasons. Firstly, we see a huge positive reaction from farmers. And a lot of this is around increased transparency and increased communication. You know, farmers have come to us and, and said to us, you know, we really appreciate the messages. We, we love the receipts or once telling me I spelt their name wrong, which was a bit, of, a bit embarrassing. Um, but also like from a business perspective, we've seen farmers uh, refuse to sell coffee to competitors because those competitors, even though they came in to try and offer the same price that we were offering to try and get in the door, but they weren't offering these other transparency tools. They weren't offering receipts. They weren't being very transparent with pricing. And so I really think that, that for us, we, we see that our farmers see our tech as very much as part of our package of offering, as part of the value that we offer, and it's around our efforts to build trust and make sure that we are respecting and valuing our farmers as key, key components, we don't take them for granted. The second reason why I think it's absolutely worth investing in and continuing to invest in is around uh, financial management or mismanagement. And, and I've talked about this a lot because it is so fundamental and when we were, first starting off, this was a big warning that we were getting from others, who many of whom had already like dropped their wet mills because of, because of this very issue. Um, but we see firsthand that with the right tech in place, you can have good oversight systems that do allow you to scale and not spend loads of time chasing financial accountability. Like, I know firsthand how hard it is to do financial reconciliations or outturn calculations in the middle of the season. I mean, it is absolute chaos. But I think the important thing to realize is that the right tools can help you do it and help you do it easily. And right now, particularly in the climate where all, all producers are being squeezed, getting this information like on time is absolutely a matter of survival. And, and lastly on this, I mean, I think all of us here care deeply about social impact, but if your organization itself isn't financially sustainable, then how are you going to deliver social impact in, in the long term? So I think getting, getting everything in order allows you to deliver more and deliver better value. And absolutely in terms of our future plans, we want to upgrade some of our systems and particularly we're looking at automation. But we do need to weigh this against the cost. It comes back to the poll around uh, you know, value for money. Uh, I mean, when we look at Comcare, if we want to do automation, it's gonna cost us a significant amount of money uh, per month, like way beyond our, our ability. But at the same time, we also recognize that doing a manual export of data and import every day, it actually does add a lot of value because you can't take the, the headline figure for granted. You, it forces you to interrogate that data. It forces you to like make sure you have a proper approval chain so that you're not just blindly copying and pasting because it, who knows what that data could be if you don't check it. I mean, our team are also demanding that we improve how we use our expenses. Uh, right now we use Google Forms, which has been working fine, but the team themselves want more visibility over what they're submitting. And, and when we consider, yes, there is, there's a, a small fee per user, but if that cuts off hours of our time in terms of putting data into our accounting software, it's an absolute no brainer. Uh, and, and lastly, in terms of some of our future plans, you know, particularly with COVID, we want to move away from cash. We, uh, uh, we'll be looking at how we can digitize payments. And this, this brings us to the crux of, of what we're trying to do. We want to be able to work more effectively with farmers and we want to provide more information back to them. So that can be like m many more frequent SMSs that can even tell them, this is how much coffee we received this week. This is how much money you should have received. Or if we're doing delayed payments, this is your balance. Because again, it's all part of building trust. Um, you know, when we do our garden assessments, we want to share that data back to farmers so that they can also make action plans with us and themselves to improve their productivity. And, and I've spoken throughout, throughout this, this session on, on gaps around financial literacy and productivity. I mean, sorry, uh, and record keeping. And this is, this is a really significant barrier for us. 
Uh, and so in the past, when we've asked farmers you know, about their record keeping or their records or how much they've sold or how much they earn, the information isn't there. But now we have it for almost 300 farmers. So when we do our next financial literacy training, we can give back to individual farmers their transaction history from the past year. And we can say to them, uh, you know, here's how you can calculate your profitability. Here's how you can calculate what you should be investing for yourself in your, in your gardens. And ultimately, we want our farmers to make informed decisions. We want them to see that we're offering the best packages and also put, put pressure on us when we're not delivering the best value for them. Thank you so much. So here again, the, the key is somehow efficiency, accessibility, but also, you know, the willingness of uh, making sure that the farmers are owning the data more in terms of um, being, being able to, to make the right decision for themselves, which is, which is um, very much connected also to the opportunity to keep this, this into consideration when, when scaling. And I know, Rachel, that um, for NKG Bloom, uh, scalability has is, is definitely been a success. <laughs> I know that you moved from 150 farmers to around 20,000 now. So I guess that uh, the question of scalability for you will be more connected to, you know, what would you recommend uh, or what, do you, what are the main aspects that needs to be taken into consideration uh, when, when scaling these tools at origin? Um, I think really in, in, in very few minutes, uh, I think before, before we even talk about scalability, uh, whoever is getting into this, uh, one of our key lessons, uh, that we've taken away from the past three years is that it takes time. It takes time to know our environment. It takes time to define the, the right products. It, it takes time to convince farmers. Yes, it does. Uh, it takes time to establish a trust relationship. Um, uh, for for my one of my products, fertilizer, for fertilizer to show its effect. Um, yeah, so I think uh, any form of uh, working in this space, there has to be a realization that this will take time, and 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 uh, this should. It's it, you can't go. There's no way around it. You will need to to invest some time in this. Um, the other t biggest lesson for us has been th that if it's a win-win, it has to work. Uh, it's working as long as it's a win for us as a business, because this is not a CSR that we're doing. It's, it's a business opportunity that we saw. And for the farmer as well, I, I mentioned that we, uh, from our midline uh, results, our midline study results, we, we, we see a 90% increment in farm level productivity for the farmers. So they see that this extra investment in uh, buying fertilizer, in taking the cash uh, for investing in, in labor, labor to do weeding, labor to do pruning, um, is, is paying off for them. And, and so it has to work. It, it, it can't be a one-sided um, benefit. It has to be a win-win a win-win for both. But if that has been achieved and, you know, you've given this time and it's a win-win for, for whoever's involved in this, I think one of our key success factors has been, um, one, get good partners. And these might be partners that are technology partners. These might be partners that are financial. These might be partners um, that are knowledge sharing, a community of practice or people that have done this. I, I think somebody talked about it. I'm not sure who of my other panelists did. Um, so whatever form of partners that one can get this, 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 because really, I think it's difficult to do this alone. It's difficult to do this alone and then reach scale. So whatever form of partners, you need good vendors, you need good software development, de development uh, farms, because uh, for you to do a system that can aff afford 150 and then one that can afford 20,000 might be something different. So uh, my software vendors are very clear on my, the kind of environment that I work in. And today I could ask for development and then tomorrow see that uh, the playing field has changed. And I'm like, no, 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 I want that change now. So they are able to understand that my, my, my environment is dynamic. Uh, my farmers' needs are sometimes different in terms of functionality in, in the IT systems. Um, so yeah, I, I would say get yourself good partners, be it financial or IT. 
I think the other thing that we also have said is um, going paperless, I think Ankur mentioned this, going paperless, going presentless, and going cashless. That is definitely where I'm going as well. Um, and so it is, I think it's, it's scalable and, and it's, it's doable. It's, it's very doable. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you so much, Rachel, really. So I think here for, for, here for you, probably the, the key words has been really like partnership in a way and collaborations among uh, different entities. And I do know that this is a bit of a key word also when we talk about uh, scaling um, digital services connected with, with uh, financing. So Ankur, I know this is a bit uh, your um, um, your your core expertise, and uh, it will be interesting to know your perspective in terms of what what do you feel is is the best model when when we talk about digitalizing finance. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this is very interesting because um, what's happening now is that uh, so I want to go back to what how a lending institution works and there are just three key pillars of any lending institution. Um, one is that uh, right and profitable customer sourcing, um, credit assessment, and finally collections. What, what used to happen earlier was that one bank used to own uh, all three steps. Uh, but with uh, the advent of you know, technology and fintech, uh, what happened is that all these three key pillars have been unpacked. And now uh, it's it's not the bank's game anymore. Uh, there, there are, uh, in fact, banks are now uh, tying up with other people to actually become stronger in one of these pillars. And especially right and profitable customer sourcing is a space that has uh, completely exploded with uh, uh, people coming, um, people tying up with partners who have the access to customers. Now that can be, um, it can be a mobile company, it can be a FMCG company, um, it can be a fintech, an agritech, it can be anyone. And then the bank will come in at the back end and do the credit assessment for them. Uh, and it, in fact, credit assessment has also not uh, really uh, uh, stayed with the banks anymore. There are a lot of credit uh, assessment uh, tech companies that have come into the picture. So essentially what I'm seeing is there are two broad trends that are happening in the digital financial services space, which is making it more accessible and affordable. One is that the, there is an emergence of bundled solution providers. Um, so uh, some key examples that come to my mind are uh, Tula and Apollo Agriculture in Kenya. Um, you know, they, they will give you uh, agri inputs, advisory, market linkages, and financial services all under the same roof. Um, as uh, Rachel was also mentioning, NKG is doing quite similar thing. And this has also been a trend with, these uh, with, with a lot of these large traders who are trying to offer all these services uh, in, in, in one package. Uh, another big one is in Myanmar called Impact Terra, which is, uh, which is doing pretty well in this space. So this is one trend, uh, the bundled solutions provider trend that is uh, actually leading uh, smallholder inclusion. The other one is partnerships uh, and uh, partnerships with, again, different kind of entities. So uh, I'll share an example here in India. There is a FinTech uh, fairly recent called Jay Kisan. It has tied up with, uh, you know, machinery providers, agri machinery providers and it's providing uh, loans at the at the uh, point of purchase uh, and uh, it's, it's it's a very different kind of model where uh, it, it based on relationships of the agri dealers uh, the tech, uh, the equipment dealers and the farmers in the region they they tailor their products for that uh, for that region itself um, i know that mastercard has in south africa has tied up with printord bank and net one uh, to get uh, a large part of South Africa financially included. So Pintor Bank will provide a banking license and the bank accounts. A MasterCard will provide the network and the access to POS and ATMs. And NetOne provides the biometric technology uh, and customer onboarding. Um, so that's what's happening. Uh, 
what i foresee uh, is that the financial services uh, will become the the end goal for most of the digital platforms who especially have access to small holder data uh, so they everyone will eventually end up uh, either tying up with a financial services provider or offering the financial services them um, whatsapp has gotten into financial services uh, uh, whatsapp pay launched in brazil it's going to uh, go live in india very soon i mean the the uh, the opportunity is huge in whatsapp pay going live uh, i i can foresee an, any agri input provider or a trader just tie up with whatsapp and uh, you can start uh, digital payments to the farmers instantly so yeah it, it, lots lots of interesting things to watch out thank you so much ankur so i guess whatsapp is receiving <laughs> The, many compliments today during this webinar, which is <laughs> not done on purpose. <laughs> um, so I guess now we'll open, we'll we'll use a, a few more minutes. I know this has been, um, and I thank for everyone that has been uh, with us for for the old webinar. Um, so I guess the first question was directed to Rachel, and it was um, from Florence Lalo. I hope I'm I'm uh, pronouncing this correctly from Clima Ventures. Um, she's asking, or uh, he's asking, I don't know, <laughs> if um, somehow your apps and IT systems have been tailor-made or uh, they were already off the shelves, like offered in the market. And um, somehow also, if you can answer that, how long the integration took um within the different systems and if you had external support on that so this is more like a specific question to the digital tools you're using thank you um yes uh our digital tools were tailor-made for us um yeah so they were not on the market tailor-made for us how long did the integration take um gosh uh, i would say comfortably for every system to talk to each other the way they're supposed to talk to each other. I would say it took six months, six months. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to make sure I've got that right, how long did, uh, have you had external support in that, in the integration or yes, uh, as, as NKG Bloom, yes, we, uh, and that was one of my, of, of my lessons that, you know, pointers, so to speak. I said that you cannot do this alone. We've had support from, IDH, for example, uh, and we have partners that, that have come together in this for us uh, to take this vision to fruition. So not just in the IT sector, but really just to run this whole pharma financing initiative uh, by Bloom. So yes, we've had extra support. Thank you so much. And I guess a question for Sanhi, uh, which is again, very specific, like, um, Arin Irina is asking if when using WhatsApp, you did courses in a group or you use a business account? Yeah, short answer, we put them in groups. Um, we are trying to mimic um, the environment that we were having in, um, you know, during our in-person training. We want to maintain that the sense of community is you know, still being provided um, through our interactions with our producers. So we are still um, maintaining that relationship through groups. Thank you so much for being so quick. <laughs> Very explanatory. Uh, and I guess the, the other question could be either for maybe Shaquille or Rachel, but um, whoever wants to take it, it's more like uh, connected to um, fair living wages. So um, uh, Bader is asking how um, you somehow help with, with living wages for farmers and primary coffee professor, uh, for processor, excuse me. In the, uh, using digital tools and somehow how you capture information and you verify it. I think the second question was somehow answered already, but I guess it's interesting to have the perspective regarding uh, fair living wages in, in this regard. And if you feel like digital tools are, are supporting the process. I will ask Shaquille to take this one. <laughs> um. I'm not sure if I fully understood the question, so I'll, I'll keep it short in case I haven't. Um, here, because the farmers are not employees for us, they're simply suppliers, uh, they are limited, their income is limited by how much coffee they can grow. So what we do when we're buying coffee is we make sure that we are buying above market rates. 
and we are uh, providing bonuses at the end of the season to make it to incentivize farmers to continue investing in their gardens uh, and in their in their coffee trees as much as possible. Uh, obviously, you can't pay four times the market rate, even if you want to, because it's just uh, it's not feasible uh, at the moment. But uh, what we do is we try to make sure that we're consistently paying above market rates to to make sure farmers feel that they are. Um, they're being paid for the extra work that we're expecting to do in terms of quality. Thank you. Yeah, I think you answered the question. <laughs> um, and maybe uh, I think this this is somehow something that um, oops, I, I lost the <laughs> I lost the question here, but it was uh, connected to the fact that if we were if you were using off the shelf uh, apps or um, something tailor made. So I would say that I can cover that maybe very quickly. I guess it really depends on from actor to actor and organizations as, for example, with Shaquille and Sahi, they've been using a system that was available for them. There was Home Care, WhatsApp, but also Google Sheet or Telerivet. And then with the racial, there was more like a, a tailored system that was built for them. So I believe that if anyone is interested, there are different tools out there. And definitely IDH can help in the process of uh, deciding which is the best tool for you. Um, I think also uh, many, many questions have been answered uh, by our speakers uh, behind the scenes here. I see a lot of discussions because there were a lot of questions uh, directed at some of them. And there's quite a lot of interest in, in understanding how has been the process for them in integrating these digital tools, which, is, which is, uh, makes me very grateful for the interaction. Um, so I guess now, just to be mindful of the time, and I know that um, it's been a very long webinar, we'll, we'll close the session. Uh, I want just to, to thank everyone that uh, joined us for so long, and um, I hope we were able to answer any questions, all the majority of questions. If not, please contact us, and um, I'm sure we will be able to get you in touch with the speakers if you have a specific question for them. And uh, finally, again, uh, thanking um, all the speakers with us today, our partners, our sponsors, and also my partner in this initiative, which has been um, Buna Origin Consulting. So thank you, everyone, and um, have a great rest of the day or uh, night, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a nice uh, and engaging session next week again on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.